Listen, Paul makes me nervous. I got it. You know this. The writings of St. Paul terrify me. They are uh, filled with a lot of words. And uh, if, you, if I've never told you before, the trick with New Testament Greek is that it doesn't have the same syntax in English. All the verbs could be at one end of the sentence, all the nouns at the beginning. They're not always intermingled. And, and the translators just had to figure out what words go where in the order of English by the context of what the writer was writing. So there's no punctuation, all that kind of very confusing. And then on top of that, Paul is sermonizing in his letters to the faithful who know the lingo. The dilemma with Paul and why he scares me so much is that the lingo has been taken by the church because Paul was the first person to write and truly preach the gospel. So he's the earliest writings that we've discovered. You know, so you imagine the book of Acts, the gospel of Luke written 70, 80 years later, right? The gospel of Mark written 50 years after Jesus got. Paul's right there 20, 20 years, 10 years, like right in the early time. Okay? So his writings came to us first, uh, or the earliest writings that we found, and they're sermons to all the little uh, communities, church tent, tent meetings and communities that he has set up as he's traveled, except for Rome, where he never ever went. He never got to Rome. It's the last letter we have of his. It's the first letter in the New Testament. It's the last he wrote. And it, it says in this, what Margaret read, I, I just wish so hope, I, I hope someday I will be able to get to you. In Rome, he's a Roman citizen, in fact, which is what sprung him out of jail, kept him from the death sentence all his life. He's a Roman citizen and would love to go to the church in Rome, but he, he never did get there. But he writes them this big letter filled with sermonizing, lots of theological lingo, and it's not what Paul believed that worries me as much as what the church has done with what Paul believed, what what the church interpreted. And in fact, I was reminded this week. And we'll get to this phrase in a minute. There was one phrase in this passage that was so hotly debated what it meant, it, it caused a violence and wars. People like to use Paul for their own good. And the church certainly has done that. And what we believe about Paul really got squeezed through the Roman church uh, and then brought to the, to the world. Anyway... Just say, if Paul confuses you and makes you nervous, you're not alone. He used a lot of terms in this one beginning chapter of Romans. It's, it's filled that the beginning is, is Paul's classic, you know, his entry into writing. You know, Paul, a servant of Christ to the church in Rome. How lovely are you? I thank you for your faithfulness. I am myself well, and I'm infused with the Spirit of God, called by the Spirit, and, you know, to proclaim the risen Christ. All this kind of stuff. He just, it's a great flowery, poof. it's like a call to worship, right? He gets going, and he uses these big terms. Gospel, uses that a lot of times. Salvation, a ton of times. Faithfulness, and righteousness. And they all kind of get mingled together as we're reading. Thank you, Margaret, for reading slowly. But if you're reading along with her, you know, faithfulness and salvation, gospel and righteousness, they all just intermingle. It's like Paul's kind of, um, I don't want to say mumbo-jumbo, but you know, it's like his stuff that he likes to say over and over again. So many times that you think, now what was, that? now he just said this and this goes here. How does that follow? Drawing a straight line through Paul is tricky. That's probably the same way with any sermon in some ways. So I was trying to get back to what Paul meant by these by these terms before they got touched by the church. And I was helped greatly by Professor Ann Jervis from Wycliffe College in the uh, University of Toronto. By uh, the word gospel, he talks about the gospel a lot, and we always translate the gospel as the good news, the story of Jesus, the risen Christ. But for Paul, gospel really, if you dig deeper, means the power of of God through the good news. So when you see Paul say the gospel, I've been brought to you by the gospel, we're living in the gospel, it's the power of God through that good news. So for him, it's a powerful thing, and it's not a one story, and it's not a certain dogma or doctrine or practices of a faithful community. The gospel is something outside of all of us because it is the very power of God in the lives of the faithful. 
So just hear that. It's the power of God, but it's not, and Paul is very certain about this, the gospel is not power over others. It's the power of God's love. So it's not ours. It doesn't belong to us. It was given to us to share, but it is God's power. And it's not to be used by human beings over other people. That's key. Then he talks about salvation, the gospel and salvation. I thought to myself this week, what is salvation? And I was going to preach all about salvation this week. Paul's very concerned with it. He uses the word salvation a lot. And, and it's, again, you understand it's a good word to, to stop here. You say salvation to any Christian. We've got a lot of things we could say. The things our grandmothers taught us. The things we learned in Sunday school. The things that we learned on 100 Huntley Street. Oh, I drove past 100 Huntley Street the other day. I had no idea where it was. And there's these buildings with, like, uh, it looked like a church with all these shops attached to it. And I went like this, and the driver of the car on the floor, on the Queensway or whatever highway you're on, she goes, oh, that's 100 Huntley Street. Just thought you should know. I saw the mothership. <laughs> but, you know, you listen to 100 Huntley Street, they got a whole other thing about salvation that might be different than United Churchy people. But the thing with the United Churchy people is you could sit next to each other and you could have a different definition of salvation. That's the trick with Paul. 2,000 years later, we read this and everybody who reads it thinks they know exactly what he means because we've developed these theologies. Salvation for Paul is about uh, self-mastery. We'll get to that in the next few weeks in Romans. But also God's love saving us from ourselves. Now, when I say saving us from ourselves, I don't want us to go into this self-hatred or this demeaning of the human. Uh, we're holy beings. God knows that. The, the, the Hebrew Scriptures taught us and Jewish theology believes that humans are holy, but we stray from our ultimate holiness. Okay? And we're on the sliding scale between unholy and holy always. That's the human condition. And Paul believes that salvation is God helping us correct ourselves to turn more towards the holy. And there's lots of ways to do that. But for salvation, it's God's saving and salvation is this, this is a beautiful quote. The gospel, God's power, is not a power that seeks power for itself. Rather, God's power, the gospel, is entirely directed toward salvation. The goal of gospel, God's power, is solving, salving, salving humanity's needs and hurts. You know, a salve is like a bomb, right? So the goal of the gospel, God's power is not for God to be used only by God. God gives it away to us as a salve for our humanity's needs and hurts. I love that. God's salvation is a salve for us. To heal our condition. To heal us in those times when we lean towards a little more disorder. A little chaos. A little unholiness. God's salvation moves us toward holiness. Healing our humanity. Healing our needs and our hurts. Then he uses the word righteousness. Intermingles it. It's like pepper. Sprinkles it all through the text. Righteousness. The righteousness of God, more particularly. And this is the one that's been fought over. I didn't know. I slept a lot through theology. The righteousness of God. Not Now, the word righteousness is used all through the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and all the New Testament all the time. But rarely is it ever used together with the word God. The righteousness of God. And that's what got fought over. What does it mean, the righteousness of God? I can't understand why there's battles, but, you know, theologians... Everybody wanted to grapple and hold for power, their own power, what the righteousness of God meant for them. God's saving power and activity could be God's righteousness. Or if we look at the Hebrew Scriptures, and here's where I like to go, to the origin of the word righteous, tzaddik, right? Which means your responsibilities and your duties to all the relations that you have. I've said this to you a number of times. Righteousness the righteousness of Job, the righteousness of Noah, is you living out all fully your responsibilities to 
every relationship you have, including your relationship to creation and your relationship to yourself, self-care. Okay? That's righteousness. So I like this idea of the righteousness of God as God living out all of God's responsibilities to creation. Okay? How's that sound? That's a little less fancy. It's nice. God living out faithfully relationship with us and with creation. Never moving. Steadfastness, we could say. Then we get with righteousness, salvation, and the gospel, we get to verse 17, and here's the powerful one. For in it, it, it he, Paul says this famous line, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You'll see that on plaques tucked into people's Bibles. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith to faith. In Greek, faith to faith, ek pistios eis pistin. Just thought I'd bring a little Greek to you today. Sometimes it's translated from faith for faith. And this is where we wrestle with God's righteousness and faithfulness. I think they could be used almost interchangeably. God's steadfastness, God's faithfulness, God's tending to the relationship is righteousness and faithfulness. Here's where it gets exciting. The power of God, the gospel, includes faithfulness from God. Righteousness. Steadfastness. God's faithfulness is so powerful and eternal that it's the source of our own faith. That's from faith to faith. From faith to for faith. Again, hotly debated what was meant by that. But I love what Professor Jervis says. She says the rest of the book of Romans and the rest of the Gospels and Paul's writings kind of attest the sense that God's faith is the root of our faith. God's faithfulness becomes our faithfulness. Now, get this. It was brand new for me this week. I think about grace coming from God. That's the big word. Grace. God's unconditional love. I think about love coming from God. I think about salvation from God. I've never ever once thought about faith as a gift from God. I know, gifts of the Spirit, we list faith. But I never understood what that would mean. I always thought faith was something we developed. Right? Like, we've got to have faith in God. We've got to have faith in the saving power of Jesus. Right? I always thought faith was a human activity. And Paul says it, you know, we'll be justified by faith. So we we'll better get on it. Guess what? Here's the turning. It, it just, Thursday, my whole life just blew open. Faith to faith. God's righteousness is faith to faith. That's how it's found in the world. It's faith given to us. God's faithfulness is so large and so wondrous, we get a piece of it as a gift. And the beauty of that is it just reminds us again, we don't have to worry about do we have enough faith. You know, those people we worry. I just don't know if I have enough faith. Guess what? God's given it to you already. Just like love in your hearts. Faith is there in your life as a gift from God. It again reminds me that we are not self-made people. It's not left just up to us. God's righteousness is the good news that it's not left up to us. Nothing is left up to just us. But God in partnership, in righteousness, in faithfulness to us, gives us faith. Plenty of it. That's pretty exciting to me. I gotta say, just because I've never thought of it before. Faith is a gift. You got a little bit of it. Thank you, God. But here comes the age-old Christian question. How will that be lived out in our lives. If faith is a gift to us, why do some days we feel faithless? Or doubting? Or less faithful? Why, why do we stray if it's a gift? Well, it's just like love. We have to become open to it. So imagine God's grace flowing through the world, constant, steadfast, always. And in the subcategory of grace, we have salvation, we have love, we have faith. We'll say hope as well. Let's bring Corinthians in. Un God's faithfulness, hope and love and grace is just being showered on us all the time. And we know it's a gift. Faith is a gift. Well, but I don't know if I feel it. It's all about becoming open. The 
the, the journey of discipleship is a journey of falling open to what already is. It's not the belief that we got to start something new. That's the arrogance of discipleship. i got to figure out what faith is, and if I don't have it, it's because I'm not working hard enough. No, it's because you haven't fallen open enough. There's a difference. You don't have enough love, it's not because you're a bad person. It's because you haven't fallen open to the love that you've already been given. If you don't feel saved, it's because you've been ignoring the salvation that you've already been given. Fall open to it. Do you see the line there? As we move into Romans, I'm going to invite you to fall open to these things that Paul is teaching about. But especially to the faith that's been given us as a piece of God's great faithfulness to us. It's like this big circle. We could start singing Harry Chapin, all my life's a circle. It's this big circle. God's faithfulness is just going round and round. And we are part of God's faithfulness in that we have been given faith. So fall open to it. How do we pick it up? How do we run with it? Here's what I'm thinking. Let's bring it down to our real lives. It's not a mystery. There is lots of faith in us, in the world, to be had. So, if you're out walking in the woods, anybody going camping this summer or going for hikes in the woods? I'm going down to grasslands. There are no woods. Apparently, it's just sun and land and prairie dogs. But if you're going for a walk in the woods, or you're going to be out in the prairie, you know how you walk out in the prairie during harvest, and you run your hand along the barley and the wheat, right? It's a little sharp, but it's beautiful. You know, when you're standing, have you stood in the middle of a canola field lately? Just stood in the middle of the yellow and looked up at the sky? When you're out in creation like that, I want you to pause and not just think, oh, this is very nice. I want you to intentionally fall open by understanding that what you are receiving there is faith for the journey. You are receiving the gift of faith as you walk and smell the subboreal forest. As you put your hand on a tree trunk, and please do. I used to wrap my arms around tree trunks and hug them. Tree hugger. It's a beautiful thing to do because you can actually feel those trees and more than that, you can feel the gift of faith that comes through that experience. Or if you're uh, out in the garden, we had some gardening conversations today already before church. If you're in the garden, don't think of it as work. And don't think of it as trying to control something that's unruly. How about gardening as communion with God. Take your gloves off, put your hands in the soil. Oh, but Reverend Dave, that'll ruin my skin. Yes, it might. It, you know, there's nothing like the minerals in the soil that kind of really eat your hands up. But what if, what if that experience for a moment with your hands not doing something, just planted on the soil, is communion with God? And you say in that moment, thank you for faith, God. Thank you for faith. Or if you hold on to that child, or that baby, or the handshake from a friend, or a hug from a loved one, just hang on for a second longer and say, thank you for this faith that you're giving me. Smell a flower, walk in bare feet, on grass or sand or the forest floor. Nothing like pine needles to remind you of the gift of faith. And your feet smell good too after that. Do you understand? These things we take are so ordinary are God's gift of faith to you. It's the seeds that will grow. You can't come away from creation, from children, from real relationships without having fallen open and giving thanks for that faith that gets planted in every single one of those episodes. It's not so fancy what Paul was talking about because it's all around us, it's eternal, it's constant. It's just our job to become open. 
this summer I encourage you to embrace those moments a bit longer and to see them as this great gift that God has for all of us. And may we grow in faith as we walk together.